a very good evening to each and everybody of teleconferencing program uh, well we are back with our second sessions topic uh, the topic was management of stable copd and dr deepak bhattacharya uh, was with us in that session and dr deepak bhattacharya would continue in this session also uh, but before that i would like to tell you our phone number so that if you have any queries about this particular topic you can make a phone call and ask your queries from dr bhattacharya the number is the, the numbers are 29 5328442953284 and std code is 011 and the toll free number is 18001112345 this program is jointly conducted by indira gandhi national open university and national board of examination and the website of national board of examination is www.natboard dot edu dot in www dot n a t b o a r d dot e d u dot i n if you want to download your forms of national board of examination you can visit this website and uh, to avail the dvds of teleconferencing programs you can contact national board of examination uh, right now uh, i would move to uh, dr deepak bhattacharya to start the program dr bhattacharya please thank you to continue from where we had stopped in the last session uh, air travel is very common these days and therefore many of the copd patients who travel by air would like to know from you whether as to they could travel by air normally planes travel at a uh, commercial airlines travel at a altitude of 35 to 40000 feet and although the pressure the uh, cabins are pressurized only up to 6000 to 8000 feet therefore effectively Uh, this has a equivalent uh, FiO2 of uh, about 15% only rather than 21%. Therefore, patients with COPD can exhibit a fall of PO2 of up to on an average of 25 millimeter mercury. Therefore, pre-flight uh, assessment may be done or should be done. This could be done by the use of regression formula or by the use of uh, lowered FiO2 to uh, find out what is the amount of uh, oxygen that could be required most uh, commercial airlines have the facility of providing additional oxygen but on average if this procedure is not done addition of 2 to 3 liter of oxygen takes care of this deficiency but for high risk patients one must strictly evaluate and uh, find out what is the level of fio2 that would be required for a set patients this is a slide from gold which uh, in which gives in detail uh, the medications which should be added with the uh, progression of copd stages now surgery in copd is all surgeries are possible and uh, pre operative assessment could be done but on a broad level it should be seen that uh, surgery which is further away from the diaphragm is uh, safer in copd now second week uh, and pre operative pulmonary uh, functions could be useful but not essential always and smoking cessation for at least 4 to 8 weeks pre operatively and optimization of lung function can decrease the post operative complication after surgery early mobilization deep breathing intermittent positive pressure breathing incentive spirometry and effective analgesia would decrease the complications now what is the surgeries which are available for copd bullectomy lung volume reduction surgery and finally lung uh, transplantation now uh, in for this a trial was conducted which is called the net trial that is a national lymphoma therapy trial in which a patient who is a candidate for lung volume reduction surgery if one is investigated and we find that the fev1 is less than 20% of the predicted and the dlco is also less than 25% pre predicted and the patient has a homogeneous lymphoma then it fits into group a where this is not useful but if they have predominantly upper lobe lymphoma with the post rehabilitation exercise capacity which is good then b that is fit into group b they are good for lvrs similarly the post these patients with post rehabilitation exercise capacity which is not very good that is group c and the third and the fourth and the fifth category that is the uh, patient with no upper lobe predilection but with a post rehabilitation capacity uh, which is good and which is bad therefore group b c d are the groups where uh, lvrs might be useful now the indications therefore for lvrs is predominantly upper lobe emphysema fev1 between 20 to 45% are predicted dlco which should be more than 20% they should have a high tlc more than 120 a low exercise capacity but fit good cardiovascular status and should not be hypercapnic now uh, a new modality which has come up 
is the non-surgical lung volume reduction. Why is this used? LVRS works because it can be done less invasively. It is non-surgical, therefore is used, uh, will help more people. And what is used is an intrabronchial valve, which can be placed by a bronchoscopy. Now, this is a design. Uh, there are several which were developed. This is one of the ones which is routinely used these days and some experimental uh, use has already started uh, in certain centers. Uh, this is the uh, loading device for the LVR and uh, this can be loaded by two ways, a catheter load and a direct load. And this is the diagram of uh, after having loaded it inside. This is the between the pre-removal uh, distal view and the proximal view of the LVR. Now, in a small study done in uh, of a valve implant in eight patients who were too sick to do LVRS or refuse LVRS, it was seen in this diagram that uh, FEV1 increased by 34 percent and the DLCO increased by about 30 percent. Now, what are the indications for lung transplantation in these patients? Those patients with an FEV1 of uh, of 25 percent are predicted without reversibility and or resting room air that is POCO2 which is 55 millimeter Hg and a PO2 and a PA elevated PACO2 with progressive deterioration requiring long term therapy or those patients with an elevated pulmonary artery pressure with progressive deterioration are candidates for lung transplantation. Now there are some uh, ethical issues in which uh, a hospice or you know to advise to the patient as to when uh, one should think that enough is enough and uh, you know uh, use of oxygen and other uh, end stage mobility or lung diseases. Now there are certain indications where these patients must be referred to a specialist and usually you would be getting from the general physicians uh, most of these patients and they, these are the indications where they would be referred to a specialist. Uh, patient with disease onset less than 40 years, patient having frequent exacerbations that is two or more per, uh, per year despite adequate treatment, rapidly progressive course of disease that is the decline in FEV1, progressive dyspnea, decreased uh, exercise tolerance, unintentional weight loss, severe COPD that is FEV1 less than 50 percent predicted despite optimal treatment that is a patient who is in the need for LTOT. Uh, onset of comorbid illnesses of COPD systemic illnesses like osteoporosis, heart failure, bronchiectasis and lung cancer and those who would require the evaluation of surgery. Thank you. Management of stable COPD that was the topic of uh, this particular session and Dr. Deepak Bhattacharya was our uh, expert of this particular session and he told us about uh, about this topic or each and everything. We are very thankful uh, to Dr. Bhattacharya for being with us in our program and give uh, such valuable information. We have one more information for CME workshops for DNB candidates and consultants and that is that in order to sensitize the DNB students and consultants, some CME programs uh, would be organized and these programs are CMA program in preparing for theory examinations, CMA programs in preparing for practical examinations, CMA programs in preparing for th research uh, uh, thesis research methods, CMA programs in clinical and surgical methods, skills for DNB candidates in surgery, OBG, orthopedics and anesthesia only and CME workshops for consultants on bedside teaching, research methods and evaluation. The concerned students and consultants are required to apply for these CME programs immediately on the registration format available on the website along with the registration fee by 28th February 2009. Centers for CME programs are in New Delhi, Chennai, Hyderabad, Bangalore, Kolkata, Calicut and Pune. And one more information about the teleconferencing program of next week uh, which, will, uh, which will held on um, uh, 12th February 2009 next Thursday. The topic of that program would be radio diagnosis and neurosurgery. Right now we come back to our this week's teleconferencing program, uh, uh, specifically third session which is uh, going on. Uh, going on. Uh, right now uh, Dr. Deepak Bhattacharya had told us about the management of stable COPD but uh, in our uh, this session, in our third session, Dr. N.K. Gupta is already here and he is going to tell us about management of acute exacerbation of COPD. Uh, Dr. N.K. Gupta is a chest physician in department of pulmonary critical care medicine VMMC 
and Safdarjang Hospital, New Delhi. And uh, uh, this is the right time to hand over uh, this session to Dr. N.K. Gupta. Dr. Gupta, please. Thank you and good afternoon. <coughs> People, the students who have been with us uh, right from the beginning now by this time have been uh, uh, hearing the excellent reviews by Dr. Chakravarti and Dr. Bhattacharya regarding the COPD. They must now be very well aware of what is what constitutes COPD, uh, what are these uh, uh, clinical features, the uh, etiology, the pathogenesis, the pathology, what are the stages, the clinical uh, stages of severity and how do you manage them by the use of inhalers and other medicines. We now will recapitulate these for uh, those students who have joined just now. What is the definition of COPD? We will just recapitulate. COPD is characterized by airflow obstruction. The airflow obstruction is usually progressive, not fully reversible and does not change markedly over several months. The disease is predominantly caused by smoking and airflow obstruction is defined as FEV1 which is less than 80 percent of predicted and the ratio of FEV1 FEC which is less than 0.7. Now, the airflow obstruction is due to the combination of airways and parenchymal damage. The damage is the result of chronic inflammation that differs from that seen in asthma and which is usually the result of tobacco smoke. Significant airflow obstruction may be present before the individual is aware of it. COPD produces symptom, disability and impaired quality of life which may respond to pharmacological and other therapies which have limited or no impact on the airflow obstruction. COPD is now the preferred term for patients with airflow obstruction who are previously diagnosed as having chronic bronchitis or emphysema and other factors particularly occupational exposure may also contribute to the development of COPD. COPD as we have already heard from the pre previous speakers is uh, the third biggest cause of the respiratory death and accounts for one fifth that is 20 percent of respiratory mortality. Think of diagnosis of COPD for patients who are now above the age of 35, smokers or who are ex-smokers and have any of these symptoms like exertional breathlessness, chronic cough, regular sputum production, frequent winter bronchitis, wheeze and there are no clinical features of asthma. And we must do the severity assessment with the help of spirometry using the MRC dyspnea scale to know their degree of breathlessness and calculate their BMI which is weight loss and estimate the frequency of exacerbations. These are all important when we discuss the acute exacerbations. MRC dyspnea scale is already uh, you are well aware. There is a grade 1 which is not troubled by breathlessness except on strenuous exercise. Grade 2 is short of breath when hurrying or walking up a slight hill. Grade 3 is walks slower than the contemporaries on the level because of the breathlessness or has to stop for breath when walking at own pace. Grade 4 is when Patient stops for breath after walking about 100 meters or after a few minutes on the level. And grade 5 is too breathless to leave the house or breathless even dressing or undressing. Classification of severity by spirometry. This is the gold classification. Stage 1 which is mild when FEV1 is more than 80%. Moderate when the FEV1 is between 50 to 80% are predicted. Stage 3 is severe variety when which the FEV1 is between 30 to 50% are predicted and very severe stage 4 in which FEV1 is either less than 30 percent predicted or it is between 30 to 50 but with the signs of chronic respiratory failure. What happens if these patients undergo acute ex exacerbation? The implications are very severe. COPD is the fourth leading cause of death or third accounts for nearly 5 lakh hospital admissions each year. A COPD patient has acute decompensation nearly one to three times a year and the more number of decompensated patient has the more he has a risk of severe morbidities or mortality. 50 percent of the times these decompensations are not even reported and of those which are reported 3 to 16 percent required hospital admission and if these people are admitted in a hospital the mortality really varies from 3 to 18 percent in severe COPD patients and it's more so when these are admitted in ICU where up to 15 to 40 percent patient can die and it is more so in people who are more than 65 years of old 65 years or older when which the mortality is up to 30 percent. The recent study has found that mortality risk increased with the number of acute exacerbation of COPD experienced by a patient. 
and the highest mortality rate was seen in patients who experienced three or more exacerbations during the study. Therefore, the number of exacerbations per year is a very important factor which must always be taken into account when we are treating these patients. The results also suggested that the risk of death increases with the severity of exacerbations and it is independent of the stage of the COPD. Therefore, even a severe COPD patient, if he experiences one to three times, he has an almost an equal risk of mortality where a stage two patient who has more than four. Mortality at six months, one year or two years after hospital discharge is also very high. It is nearly 13, 22 and 35 percent respectively. 50 percent of patients actually gets readmitted within the six months and very importantly, lung functions never really usually do not return to the baseline. How do we define this exacerbation? The various definitions have been given. The, there is a plethora of definitions. American Thrust Society, Canadian Medical Associ Association, European Respiratory Society and British Society all has given their, their definitions. Initially, when in 95, the American Thrust Society tried to define it, they really could not define it because at the time they suggested since the pathogenesis was poorly understood, it is very difficult to define what really makes acute exacerbation. Canadian society defined as such events are usually uh, poorly understood, especially in clinical terms and are not easily defined in laboratory terms. British society, British thrust society actually then defined a worsening of the previously stable situation in 1997. However, Gold recently took into account all those definitions and various studies and has now come with the definition of an exacerbation of COPD which is defined as it is an event in the natural course of the disease characterized by a change in the patient's baseline dyspnea, cough and or sputum that is beyond normal day to day variations is acute in onset and may warrant a change in regular medications in a patient with underlying COPD. Remember, it is the change in the patient's baseline dyspnea, cough or sputum which is beyond the normal day to day variation. It is, has to be acute in onset and really needs a change in the regular medications. Now what is an exacerbation? A sustained worsening of patient's symptom from the usual stable state which is beyond normal day to day variations. It is acute in onset. Commonly reported symptoms are worsening breathlessness, cough, increase in the sputum volume which has now become more virulent. The change in these symptoms often necessitate a change in the medication. These may also include upper airway symptoms like cold and sore throats, increased wheeze or chest tightness, re reduced excess tolerance, there is a fluid retention, could be increased fatigue or there is an acute confusion. Winnipeg criteria has given these factors 1. Increased sputum volume, 2. Increased sputum purulence, 3. Increased dyspnea and 4. Type 1, 2 or 3 severity scale. If these factors are present and at least one of the uh, other criteria, other factors like fever, increased wheezing, increased cough, upper respiratory infection in last 5 days or there is a 20% increase in the respiratory rate or heart rate, they can be considered as a patient having acute exacerbation of his condition. Now how we go about treating these patients who now we classify them as having acute COPD exacerbation. First and foremost, there should be an accurate assessment of their condition. There is a general management, there is a bronchodilator therapy, antibiotic therapy, supplemental oxygen, anti-inflammatory therapy which includes corticosteroids. The clearance of secretion should be facilitated and patient may need assisted ventilation. Assessment of COPD basically should serve to establish the diagnosis of an exacerbation and its severity as per the definitions which is given by the goal. It should evaluate the significant comorbidities whether the patient has any cardiac decompensation or the patient has any other illness along with the COPD which could influence the degree of severity. Determine the need for additional therapies like oxygen or assisted ventilation and provide information to help decide the framework in which the patient will be treated, whether the patient can be treated at home, outpatient, inpatient or patient require admission into ICU. So 
when we go about assessing these patients the history has to be taken in a proper manner the inquiries should include presence of comorbid conditions like heart failure symptom assessments like what is the dyspnea level how much is the cough what is the sputum production level whether the sputum becomes prolonged or not and whether there is a presence of wheeze evaluation in the change in the functional status for example if a patient who has been functional has now become head, uh, uh, either a home bound or a bed bound number and outcome of the previous exacerbations as we have learned that number of exacerbations can influence the outcome of these patients and what was the current treatment the patient was on and whether there is a presence of any non specific complaints like malaise insomnia sleepiness fatigue depression and confusion they may actually be related to the condition of either decrease in the oxygen levels or increase in the carbon dioxide levels also the physical examination should include the assessment for the mental status whether the patient is fully conscious whether there is a presence of cyanosis whether the patient is using accessory muscles or paroxysmal abdominal breathing is present whether the he is hemodynamically stable or instable whether there are signs of right heart failure or what is the oxygen saturation in the outpatient or in the emergency investigations we must include investigations including chest radiograph the arterial blood analysis with clear what is the inspired oxygen concentration there should be an ecg the count should be taken and if there is a facility for checking the theophylline level the patient was already on theophylines and we should send the sputum for culture if it is found prolonged chest radiographs are cause the new pulmonary infiltrate be seen because they patients normally with the chest or with the lungs already damaged they may continue to produce the crackles which would not be able to which we would not be able to differentiate from the new crackles so new pulmonary infiltrates would give us an idea whether the patient has any infective exacerbation signs of heart failure normally copd patients would have a narrow heart if the heart size is bigger that would suggest that this patient could be having heart failure also plus of course we must rule out pneumothorax the implication is that the data from the observation studies have shown that in 16 to 21% of the routine x-rays show significant abnormalities and these necessitate changes in their management spirometry is not a useful adjunct in the acute exacerbations but previous test report if available may provide a helpful clue arterial blood gases arterial blood gases are the most important because they actually help they are helpful in assessing the severity of an exacerbation whether the patient's pers- previous oxygen levels if are available if they become low then they can tell us whether the patient is in ras- uh, cardiac uh, respiratory failure and if the uh, co2 levels are available they can tell us whether the patient is having hypercarbia or patient is actually having heart failure in which we do not expect the co2 levels to be high so therefore properly it assesses the degree of hypoxemia and hypercarbia uh, plus acid base status also can be known it is also helpful in identifying patients requiring ventilator support because the patients who are acidotic who having a ph of less than 7.25 would actually be needing ventilator support and may not do well on the conservative management in the treatment mainstay of the management are bronchodilator therapy use of antibiotics corticosteroids use of oxygen assisted ventilation and clearance of sputum if it is required bronchodilator drugs as we have already aware are actually into three different classes inhale anticholinergic drugs like ipratropium bromide or diatropium beta 2 agonistic age drugs which can be short acting ones or long acting ones like formitrol salmitrol and theophylines bronchodilating agents in copd have been in use for quite some time and they form the mainstay in the stable copd what about acute exacerbations in acute exacerbations the studies have shown that if we use short acting beta 2 agonist or anticholinergic agents there is a similar increase in the fi1 so the choice is entirely on the physician what he wants to use whether he want to use short acting ones or whether he want to use anticholinergic agents 
the choice actually also depends on potential undesirable side effects because excess use of short acting beta agonist can actually cause lot of undesirable tachycardia and may potentiate any comorbid conditions like heart failure adding a second bronchodilator to the first one does not seem to add too much of benefit and methylxanthines do not offer any additional improvement what about the drug delivery system it has been found that whether we use nebulizers or whether we use uh, do, uh, mdis there is no difference in the mode of delivery second important factor has been found is the infections now what causes the infection what causes the exacerbation in one third of the patients normally no reasons for the exacerbations can be found but in those the the reasons have been found it is found that majority of them either are due to the bacterial or viral exacerbation infections or due to air pollution bacteria forms nearly 40 to 50% of these and the more important bacteria in this is h influenza step pneumonia and m catarrhalis virus is responsible for nearly 30% of the identifiable infections and influenza para influenza rhinovirus forms the largest group the atypical bacteria is actually very small in number only 5 to 10% which is c pneumonia and air pollution is a significant 10 to 25% which is responsible for the exacerbations most commonly associated bacterial includes haemophilus para influenzae h influenzae streptococcal pneumonia moraxella catarrhalis pseudomonas arizonosa other gram negative bacilli and alpha hemolytic streptococci as you will note that the gram negative bacilli are the one which is commonly responsible for the exacerbations in copd and not the gram positive ones this is one of the airways showing a greenish discharge which is a suggest to be a bacterial in origin a bacterial infection in the in the airways a, a classification have been proposed on the basis of the stage of the disease and what is the infective agent which is responsible therefore what medicine can be used for these patients if the patient's baseline condition is in stage 1 and the there is an acute tracheobronchitis usually there is no underlying structural disease then the pathogen has commonly found to be viral in origin and in this virus influenza is nearly 35% para influenza is about 25% and rhino virus is 20% so nearly 80% is actually found by these three viruses other insignificantly corona virus adeno virus or respiratory syncytial virus has been found there is no need for any antibiotic these patients however a macrolide or a tetracycline has been suggested in the class in the in the studies in the stage 2 which means include either the stage 2 uh, of the severity or up to stage 3 of the severity the baseline clinical status is only simple chronic bronchitis fev1 is normally 50% or more there is an increase in the sputum volume and purulence and the it is usually exacerbations are uh, bacterial in origin the pathogens are h influenza catarrhalis or step pneumonia and the therapy which is suggested is amoxicillin in complicated chronic bronchitis in stage 3 and stage 4 of the severity the fev1 is normally less than 50% or in those patients where there is a age more than 65 or they are having more than four exacerbations per year or there is a significant comorbidity the therapy suggested is either quinolones penicillin with beta lactamase inhibitor or second or third generation cephalosporins or second generation macrolides if the patient is in very severe chronic stage then the infection are usually m uh, usually h influenza catarrhalis step pneumonia and pseudomonas also are found in these normally these patient who are already ventilated or has hospital admissions or are on uh, uh, things like uh, proton bomb inhibitors 